Well, thank you very much for having us. We're very nice to be down in Berkeley. It's a little less smoky here than it is in West Sonoma County, so we wasn't too bad coming down. But uh, welcome to the sociological world of the global power elite. In this book, we present information that shows how the transnational elites interact as a class of people and functions as managers of global capital. We identify over 300 specific people as the key managers of concentrated capital. These are the, the power elite core of the transnational capitalist class. They generally know each other, often personally, do business together. They hold significant personal wealth, share similar educational and lifestyle backgrounds, and retain um, common global interests. Nearly all serve on the board of directors of major capital investment firms or other man major corporations and banks. They meet in non-governmental policy organizations and form new ones as needs arise to privately make decisions for government, security forces, and world institutions to implement. The richest man in the world, Jeff Bezos, $160 billion, although I think he lost a few in the last couple of weeks, but founder and CEO of Amazon, <clears throat> owner of the Washington Post, Princeton University graduate, and the first person in the world to be worth over $100 billion. Right behind him is Bill Gates, pushing $100 billion right now. Um, and right behind them is, he was, he's a Harvard grad, right behind them is Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, these are the three richest people in the world. Um, they make major philanthropic donations to charities of their choice, and they all receive significant attention from the corporate media. However, individually, they are just big trees in a forest. And so we're here to talk tonight about the sociology of the forest. And we focus on the elites and power and who these people are. And if you think like a redwood forest, all the tr all the roots are interconnected. So the power elite in the world, the core, are the ones managing the global capital, facilitating its continued growth, and protecting it um, militarily and through intelligence agencies. Central to the idea of ca globalized capital is the transnational capitalist class, theorized in academic literature for some 20 years now. Giants reviews the tradition from the nation-state power elites described by C. Wright Mills in 56 to the transnational power elites centralized in the control of global capital today in the world. The global power elite function as non-governmental network of similarly educated wealthy people with common interests of managing, facilitating, and protecting global capital. In Giants, we follow the tradition of C. Wright Mills, the power elite. He related the power networks affecting our lives and the state of society in 1956. He described those power elites as those people who decide what is to be decided of major consequence. 62 years later, elites have globalized and build institutions that facilitate the preservation and protection of capital investment everywhere in the world. One of the first to do research on this was a transnational capitalist class book by Leslie Sklar from the London School of Economics and Political Science. He argued that globalization had elevated transnational corporations to more significant international roles. The result is that nation states actually become less significant than international agreements developed through the WTO, international institutions. <clears throat> Our efforts to identify the most important networks of the global power elite, we name 300 individuals in the book, <clears throat> in the book as the core policy planning, non-governmental networks that manage and protect concentrated global capital. These global elites are the activist core of the transnational capitalist class. Deep inside the transnational capitalist class is what David Rothkoff calls a superclass. In his book from 2008, The Superclass of Global Power Elites, he, was, he worked for Kissinger for a long time. He went to Davos every year 
Um, he said that there's six to seven thousand people, one thousandth of one percent. Um, they are the Davos attending Gulfstream private jet flying mega corporation interlocked <coughs> policy building elites of the world. People at the pinnacle of power. They're 94 percent male, mostly white, mostly from North America and Europe. And he says that these are the people setting the agendas on the G7, the G20, NATO, the World Bank, and the WTO. 6,000 is still too many to sociologically analyze, so we narrowed it down a bit to the core 300. Helping us understand that was William Carroll's work on the making of the transnational class of 2010. So he was studying how board of directors had, had been shrinking. And that uh, in that 10 year period from 96 to 2006, the average corporate board went from 20 to 14. So power was consolidating. And then he said that the banks were assuming a major role um, in terms of the central power structures glo globally. William Robinson, uh, University of California at Santa Barbara, he introduced, in his, he did the introduction to the book Giants. He said, we're living through a time of dire global crisis. Social polarization and worldwide <clears throat> Has, has reached unprecedented levels. So the Oxfam report of 1% of humanity controlled half the world's wealth, 20% um, controlled the 95% of the wealth. So we're looking at most of the world living on 80% living on less than $10 a day. Robinson wrote in his book, The Theory of Global Capitalism, Production Class and State in Transition, five, about the 500 years of capitalism has led to a global shift in which all human activity is transformed into capital. In his view, the world has become a single market with privatized social relationships. Robinson's book, 2014, Global Capitalism and the Crisis of Humanity, kind of helps us understand the concentration of wealth is causing a world crisis. Inequality, environmental degradation, global violence, economic destabilization, is this crisis that he says we're imminently facing. We've centralized capitals so much to the point that investment opportunities are limited. Capital is so concentrated, they run out of places to invest. And there's three mechanisms where excess capital is used. It's, there's financial speculation, such as the subprime mortgage interest, which almost collapsed the entire world in 2008. And it was 30, billion in, 30 trillion in this country and 300 trillion worldwide that kind of increased uh, the amount of capital that elites had to loan and spend. Um, <clears throat> there is the privatization of public resources. So water, schools, highways, anything that can have, offer return is being privatized and, and bought up with this excess capital. That's the neoliberal approach to buying it, and controlling everything. And the third way to siphon off ex excess capital is, is permanent war. And we've seen that, particularly since 9-11, but uh, preparing for war, spending and blowing up places, and, and then rebuilding and, and filling the war machine is another way of using up excess capital from the global uh, 1%. The, the, war, the wars that we're seeing, I mean, that one bomb made by Lockheed Martin that blew up that school bus a few weeks back in Yemen, a bit of a profit was made. The Saudis bought the bomb from Lockheed Martin, a little bit of that profit, and it goes back in, in some small percentage to, to all the capital investment. You know, that's what they're doing. In our research, we identify the people on the boards of directors of the top 17 asset management firms. We call these the global giants. These are firms that have in excess of $1 trillion of capital that they're managing. There's 17 of these, these companies, and they collectively controlled $41 trillion in funds in, in 2017. It's closer to $50 trillion today. Uh, they operate in every country in the world. They are decision makers regarding the financial capital that powers the global economic system. Some of these are BlackRock, 
currently has $6 trillion worth of capital that they're investing. Now think what a trillion is. A trillion is a thousand billions. And, um, you know, so the, imme the immensity of the resources that these companies are controlling, it, it, it's just huge. It's most of the cap, it's most of the free-flowing capital in the world. I mean, Apple's worth a, worth a trillion dollars now. But that includes buildings and patents and, 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 and all that as well as whatever cash they have. We're, this is what we're talking about, literally, cash and securities. So BlackRock is the biggest. Vanguard's right behind them at $5 trillion in 2018. J.P. Morgan, $3.8 trillion in 2017. Allianz from Germany, they own Pemco here in the U.S. They're $3.3 trillion. Pemco's a major bond investor market in, in the U.S. UBS out of out of. Bessel, Switzerland, uh, $2.8 trillion. And the rest are the Bank of America, Barclays, State Street, Fidelity Management, that total out to the 17 firms, 199 directors, $41.1 trillion of assets and management. <clears throat> the, the, at, these firms invest in each other. This chart shows all the interconnections, and the person that made this chart, Jordan, is sitting right here. Wave, wave your hand. <laughs> My research assistant at Sonoma State. It's a beautiful chart. It's in the book. Um, and I mean, it's just, it just shows how they're all interconnected. $400 billion interconnected just between those 17 giants. So it's one vast interconnected network of global capital controlled by only 199 people. They could have a stand-up cocktail party in this room. I mean, it's a very small number of people. Um, <clears throat> in addition, another chart by Jordan, um, the giants are invested in the three big new giants, P, the ones on the green on the left, PMP, Northern Trust, and Wil Wil Wilmington. Uh, they all exceeded a trillion um, in, in 2018. And then we have the ones that are the near giants, those are the orange ones, and there's nine of them, eight of them. And they're, but they're all interconnected. This, this network right here is well in excess of $50 trillion of capital. Um, and, and it's important, they, they're all heavily invested in, in, in Silicon Valley. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Facebook, hundreds of billions of dollars are invested in shares from, from these specific people. And we look at that exciting news about Amazon becoming the first trillion dollar company in for, exciting news for capitalism, the first trillion dollar company, <laughs> in, you know, to, to be at the top at that level. And, the com and these, these companies, Vanguard's got 56 billion in Amazon, BlackRock has 50 billion, FMR 33 billion, Capital 33 billion. So 58% of Amazon shares are owned by investment companies. And that's what has pushed Bezos to being the richest person in the world. They keep investing there, driving the share price up, making Bezos richer, uh, and getting you know, capital return in, in that capacity. Our 17 giants have $55 billion invested in Coca-Cola. Coke's a major contributor to obesity, type 2 diabetes and tooth decay. More than 10 people taste teaspoons of sugar in every single bottle of Coke. Some 80, 184,000 deaths occur a annually linking to Coke and other sugary beverages. Coca-Cola alone, the world's largest soft drink company, released 110 billion single-use plastic bottles into the environment in 2017. They don't get recycled, but it takes 400 years for a plastic Coke bottle to, to deteriorate in, in the environment. The, to, the wealth, total wealth of the world is estimated to be close to $250 trillion, with the U.S. and Europe holding approximately two-thirds of that total. <clears throat> the poorest half of the world lives on less than two fifty dollars a day. The bottom $1.3 billion live on $1.25 a day. As I mentioned earlier, 80% of the people live on less than $10 a day. So that gross inequality, now these power elites, 
they say, oh, well, capitalism is doing so great. I mean, we've got the largest middle class ever, like 20%. And even those are, there's the, the disparity between somebody with, you know, um, middle class income and the elites themselves is just huge. But they say, well, that's what capitalism is going to do. We'll just continue to grow and more, pe more people become middle class. And, um, you know, that's, that's, and it'll trickle down. Well, it's not happening. And it's not going to happen. Not with half the people in the world living on, on less than $3 a day. I mean, this is 800 million people suffer from chronic hunger. 3.1 million ch children under the age of five die every year from starvation. 30,000 people a day die from starvation and malnutrition in, every day in the world. This slaughter is, is happening. It's 10 million a year. Chronic hunger is mostly a problem of distribution. One third of all the food produced in the world is wasted or lost. It's thrown out because it's not profitable to sell it. The wars continue to, the 9-11 wars continue to wreak havoc, chaos, and death in the Middle East, Africa, and out of the regions. More than 65 million people are displaced refugees fleeing war and famine. And these wars are not just the results of military interventionism um, or, or, or political conflicts. They're motivated by propagandized ideological fears and the desire for profit on military investments. Permanent war on terror is good for business and capital investment. War becomes an institutionalized mechanism for continued elite capital concentration and growth. For many, the ultimate crisis of humanity short of global nuclear war is the environmental degradation. Religious scholar David Ray Griffin asks in his book, Unprecedented, can civilization survive the CO2 crisis? Since pre-industrial times, temperature has risen 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, causing significant changes in our world's, our world's weather. Giants are heavily invested in the only 100 companies that produce 70% of the world greenhouse gases. 100 companies is what's putting out the greenhouse gases. And they're heavily invested by um, the giants. So even if CO2 emissions are drastically cut within the next 12 years, they're saying, we will continue to see rising temperatures for decades ahead. These temperatures will lead to Severe weather events, extreme storms, record-breaking heat and floods, tidal surges, high death rates, financial loss, and of course, fires. These disruptions and shortages will lead to climate wars and civil unrest. All of this in the near future, if left unchecked, will result in ecosystem collapse and massive extinction of life on Earth. And this is eminent. You know, I'm retirement age, but I'm, I'm, I'm look, we're looking at the realities of this in our, in our lifetime, in my lifetime. So the global power elite identified in this book are the world's central capitalist money managers. Each year they accumulate greater concentrations of wealth and in, are embedded in an unrelenting quest for more. So this capitalism, this concentration of wealth, it's like a bicycle. And they keep putting more on the backpack concentrating it, and they keep, keep going down the road. And you're like a bicycle. If you stop, you fall over. So they're compelled to continue to increase capital and, and continue forward. Um, if, they, if it falls down, it's called, you know, stagnation. No investments, no jobs, no, no you know, money available in the bank. I mean, it just collapse. So we believe that... Um, by naming the global power elite, which we do in this book, we encourage, may encourage some of them to recognize their own humanitarian impulses, whereby they can collectively, under intense pressure from all of us, from social movements, from political pressures, everything that we can do, convince them to make some adjustments to change the trickle down to a river down to all human, human, human people in the world. So when we identify the 199 people 
as the <clears throat> financial manager of global capitalism, these are the people that we have to address and say, don't let it collapse. Don't let it collapse environmentally and don't let it collapse economically. You have grandkids too. And um, so part of the naming of these people in this book is that that's what this is about. Because they could, in fact, make changes that would address some of these issues rapidly. They are the central decision makers regarding financial capital that empowers the global economic system. Western governments and international bodies work in their interests to protect the financial core and allow for free capital investment and debt collection everywhere in the world. That's what governments are for. That's what the CIA is for. That's what our military empire is for. We'll meet some of these people. James Diamond, Morgan Chase, CEO. He's on the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Goes to the World Economic Forum. He's on the Council of Foreign Relations. Trustee at the University of, of <clears throat> New York School of Medicine. He's an MBA at Harvard. Net worth $1.3 billion. J.P. Morgan compensation $27 million in 2016. Lloyd Blankfein, Chairman CEO Goldman Sachs, although he just recently announced his retirement. He's on the Dean's Council at Harvard, World Economic Forum, Council of Foreign Relations. J.D. out of Harvard, net worth $1.1 billion. Compensation $20 million uh, from Goldman Sachs in 2016. Larry Fink, BlackRock. He's also on the PNC Financial Services Group. They're closely inter interlocked. He's on the New York Stock Exchange, Council of Foreign Relations, Business Roundtable, trustee at New York University. He goes to the World Economic Forum, director at the Council of Foreign Relations, MBA out of UCLA, um, $25 million in 2017, and he's worth about, about $500 million at this point. Eskin Bowles. Lead director of Morgan Stanley. He's um, <clears throat> also capital partners. He's on Facebook's board, Northrop Summon uh, Southern Corporation. Former president of emeritus of the University of North Carolina system. Deputy special envoy of the United Nations, chief of staff at, for the president, of the United States Small Business Administration, World Economic Forum. Um, he gets paid three hundred thousand from three hundred eighty thousand from Morgan Stanley. Owns seven million dollars of their shares. He's married to Crandall Bulls. We couldn't get a, find a picture of Crandall Bulls. There are a lot of pictures of Crandall Bulls, but there wasn't any in public domain. So, you know, we, so we don't have a picture of her. But she's, it's the only married couple um, in this top um, 200. And um, she's director of J.P. Morgan Chase. And she's on the World Economic Forum, Business Council, Global Research, um, it's North Carolina Press. She's a trustee at the Brookings Institute. And um, together, their net worth is approximately $200 million today. The New York Times said it was $60 million, and that was in 1999. So 18 years later, we figure they're closer to $200 million. But a lot of this is private. You can't get this. All you could really get are the um, get estimates, um, which are often under, under, way under, as we found. And we, we went to, for all these people, we went to um, NASDAQ, we went to their, their corporate board um, reports, their, their annual reports, which have to report the shareholders on their board of directors, the shares they hold, and their annual salary. So all of these people, we did, we did that work. And then we looked at, um, you know, so we're able to put their public wealth out. Ruben Jeffries III is uh, director of Barclays Bank in London. Uh, he's also uh, from on the Rockefeller uh, Company Investment uh, Group. They're kind of small time with only $43 billion. Um, he's on the National Security Council, Council of Foreign Relations, Atlantic Council, Trilateral Commission. Um, he's a Yale grad, Stanford JD. Um, he's worth, well, we know he's, his Barclay shares, he's got $200 million. He, He's worth approximately $80 million of shares there, and um, he has a, a ninth a Park Avenue house that's worth $9 million, so we know he's wealthy. Dambisa um, Moya, she's a director on Barclays, Bank, on Barclays. She's also on the Barrett Gold Corporation. She's from Zambia. Um, she's on the Chevron board. 
She goes to the World Economic Forum. She's in the Bilderberger Group just this year, just this year. Graduate from Oxford. Um, she's on multiple boards, um, Chevron, Barclays, uh, Barrett Gold, which she cl collects around several hundred thousand a year just to be on those boards of directors. Um, that's the public information. She was on Bill Mars about uh, three months ago, gave a nice talk. She has a book out on, on, on capitalism. Um, the, these giant corporations do things that are illegal from time to time. And one of the biggest ones was the LIBOR scandal going back to uh, 2003, where J.P. Morgan, UBS, Barclays, and 13 others were all implicated in a scandal that was a falsifying data used to create uh, benchmark rates. And these are all the interest rates for insurance. So you paid higher for your car insurance, home insurance, student loans, credit cards, because they cheated. Um, they have paid billions of dollars of fines, some of them, some J.P. Morgan paid 360, Citigroup paid 400, and they all admitted that we were sorry. Uh, Deutsche Bank paid 2.5 billion in fines. But for them, it's just sort of like the cost of doing business, nobody has to go to jail. Um, they got caught. Um, and they, they got caught again in 2015 for currency exchange market rates. All the same ones were indicted, but no, I mean, were charged and paid fines, but nobody went to jail. So we don't claim that any single individual identified in this study has done anything illegal. I didn't want to claim that in a book. But um, certainly they have a system where capital is relentlessly seeks ways to achieve maximum return. And sometimes they will manipulate that, that, some of the aspects that they have control over. The 199 directors that manage this top 17 have very similar backgrounds and training. Almost all have attended elite private colleges, 28 attended Harvard and Stanford. People from 20 nations make up the financial core. Um, 116, 60% are from the US, 22 each from Britain and France, 13 from Germany, Switzerland, and then many other countries, Italy, Singapore, India, Austria, or have people in this financial core. They take active part in global policy groups, financial core service advisors, the World Bank, um, the International Monetary Fund, the G20, the G7, the WTO, the Bank for International Settlements. All of these organizations, it's important to note, are governmental institutions. Now some governments get a lot more votes inside of these than others. The richer you are, the more votes you get. Um, so the U.S. is the most influential in, in all of these organizations. Like the G7 is composed of, of the seven wealthiest countries, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, UK, and the United States. And you think, well, gosh, isn't China as, as wealthy as all of those? Well, they don't let China play. They, they tell China that, that they're not an advanced economic country because they're per capita income is, is, is lower, even though they're worth a lot more than most of these other countries. Um, <clears throat> so each of these are governmental organizations. So they're subject to the political influences within a country and political parties and, and politics and reviews and that kind of stuff. What we're really talking about here as part of the global power elite is the, is the organizations of elites that aren't governmental. So one of those is, of course, the World Economic Forum at Davos. Um, it's not a formal policy-making body. Um, it serves an educational consensus-building function for thousands of transnational capitalist elites through exclusive discussion and meetings. Uh, the top 1,000 global corporations with five billion or more can send up to five people at $25,000 per person 3,000 attended in 2018. It's in Davos in the snows in January at 5,000 feet. And mostly it's 80% of leading corporations of the world send people there. There's several hundred from civil society. Some heads of, of state are there. Um, each corporation can send five people as long as one of them is a woman. So
So that's how that's their sort of affirmative action process that gets women women attending there. And and our view of the, of the World Economic Forum is that it's similar to the annual summer encampment of the San Francisco Bohemian Club. Both events host thousands of elites, only men, of course, at the Bohemian Club, to hear selected keynote panels from famous, important individuals on major socioeconomic topics of the day. And, um, but there's no there's discussion time for meet and greet, but there is no time, they don't make formal policy recommendations. So it's kind of a consensus building process. The Bilderberg Group has been around since 1954. Each year, a couple hundred elites meet in private resorts uh, all over the world. They were in Canada. They, last year, I think they were in Germany. Um, yeah, 16 was held in Dresden, Germany. They also are a private place for elites to meet, have policy discussions, but there's no formal policy making. The Bilderberg Group doesn't say, well, this, we recommend that this happen to the World Bank or anything like that. Another place that this happens a lot is at the International Monetary Conference. This is hosted by the American Bankers Association annually. Um, again, they meet, but there's no formal policy making that, that's going on. Perhaps the most important, powerful, elite, private policy organization is a group of 30. The G30, sometimes is called, aims to deepen an understanding of international economic and financial issues and to explore the international repercussions of decisions made in the public and private sectors. The G30 is a highly influential institution in the arena of global finance and governance, based in Washington, founded in 1978. It has policy groups made up of elite bankers, financiers, policymakers, ac academics, their reports are widely sp spread widely, widely accepted, and implemented across the globe. It's a nonprofit corporation funded by Rockefeller originally, now with over a million a year, it gets funds from private sources. You may notice that it looks like it's all men. It is. There's one woman, Grace Kelly, from the uh, Australian Bankers Association. They were a little sensitive about this, so last year they added the other woman there. Maria Ramos, she's the CEO of Barclays Africa Group, has recently joined. Um, the Group of 30 has direct membership in the IMF, the Bank for International Settlements, the World Bank, the Bessel Committee, the Financial Stability Board, the G7, the G20, the WTO, and the Federal Reserve. All 32 of these members have been keynote speakers at Davos. Six of the financial giants have direct representation on the G30. And they bring together 32 of the most powerful people in the world. They're essentially the executive committee of the global power elite. The other one that's really important, that's non-governmental, is a trilateral commission. Executive committee has a membership of 55 power elites. The commission was formed in 1973 to bring together unofficially, that is, no official government oversight the highest level of the elites to address important international problems. The G30 and Trilateral Commission are both um, corporation, nonprofit corporations that support independently from government funding. Twelve of the 17 uh, trillion dollar giants have one or more representatives on either the G30 or the Trilateral Commission. Goldman Sachs has four directors on both groups. Originally, the Trilateral Commission was set up to be only the United States, Europe, and Japan when it was first formed. Rockefeller and Brzezinski went to Bilderberg Group in, in, in the early 60s, and they thought, wow, this is pretty cool. We should do this in the U.S. So they set it up. The Trilateral Commission was set up, and now, now it has 375 members from 40 countries around the world. And if a member joins government, then they're asked to step down and have someone else from their country come. So it's non-governmental. Uh, a, a trilateral commission task force report, re re which was done in 2014, entitled Engaging Russia, a Return to Containment. This report expressed alarm over the, quote, Russian invasion in the Crimea, I, I have invasion in, in quotes there. 
the Russians already had bases there. The, the, the Crimea was 90% plus Russian already. Um, and when we overthrew, the, when we helped the Ukraine government pull a coup there, we knew full well the Russians weren't going to give up the Ukraine. But it was set up so that the, the, the propaganda that comes out is that, um, you know, in short, Russia always was and will remain different. This is a quote from their report. The acceptance of the otherness should be a premise for forming our view on Russia's future and our relationships with her. Even if Moscow seeks a normalization with the West, the nature of Putin's regime permits little more than a transactional U.S. government relationship on a narrow range of issues. Putin's departure from office, however, will produce a transformational moment that pretends real socioeconomic change in Russia. Russian politics will be re can be invented almost from the ground up, perhaps creating possibilities for reproachment. So the Trilateral Commission is calling for a regime change in Russia. I mean, they were quite clear about it five years ago. Putin, of course, knows this. And, and as we see from the ideologists, the, the, the me mass media, I call them the ideologists in the book, um, Putin is, is all kinds of negative reports on Putin and Russia and what they're doing and they're hacking our elections and all this kind of stuff has been ongoing now since the, particularly in the last five years. Concerned with Putin and the topic of his removal are clearly uppermost in the minds of the trilateralists. Global power elite business leaders are salvating over the opportunities Russia's vast economic resources offer for capital investment. Um, at, you know, gas, oil, minerals, all of, all of that mass land, that land mass of Russia, um, we would very much like to have full, easy access to capital investment in those regions. Some of the people on the, on the Trilateral Commission and the Council of 30 are Jacob Finkel, the uh, chairman and CEO of J.P. Morgan Chase, Tim Geithner, former Secretary of Treasury, uh, Director of the Council of Foreign Relations, President of Warburg Pincus. Philip Hildebrand is um, Swiss uh, Vice Chair of BlackRock in, in Europe, former chair of the Swiss National Bank, Bilderberg Group. Uh, Jean-Claude Trichet, um, Bank for International Settlements, Honorary Chair of the Group of 30, it's the Bilderberg Group, European Chair of the Trilateral Commission former governor of the Bank of, of um, France. Alex Weber is UBS, Bank for International Settlements, CEO of UBS, International Monetary Fund. The, the power elite continually are worrying about the unruly exploited masses rising in a rebellion. As a result of these class insecurities, they know that they're just one thousandth of one percent or less of the world's population controlling this mass amount of wealth. Elites work hard to protect their structure of concentrated wealth. The military empire, the U.S., has been the protector of global capitalism. Our 800 bases around the world, 70 countries are, are part of that. Uh, we also work very closely with NATO, um, which is now deployed in, in 70 percent of the world's nations. U.S. and NATO together in many cases. The U.S. Special Operations Command has troops in 147 countries. Most of the missions are training exercises, but direct um, action counterterrorism strikes occur regularly, including drone assassinations and kills, capture raids. The <clears throat> head of NATO always has to be a, U a U.S. military general. We don't share that. The Atlantic Council is a global power elite policy organization established in 1961 as a voluntary alliance of countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. It's non-governmental, has a $20 million budget, 70% of those funds come from contributions and grants. The Atlantic Council produces numerous policy reports on banks, on, on, on books and papers around, on, all over in terms of U.S. NATO security interests. They publish regular weekly reports, policy recommendations is a key part of their activities. 
The 35 Atlantic Council Executive Committee members are the key power elite non-governmental group that combines financial capitalists with high-level security experts and establishment insiders. 19 of the Executive Committee specialize in global security issues with many decades of involvement. 14 have worked with managed major capital investment companies. And 19 have held high-level positions in the U.S. government and served under multiple administrations. Collectively, they make recommendations um, to the people in charge of the U.S. military, NATO, the intelligence agencies, and they are supported very much by groups like Lockheed Martin and, and all the big investment groups. The, the, the global power elite managers, facilitators, and defenders know that war and preparation for war is highly profitable. We see evidence of this from the investments of the giants by the top three military companies. Lockheed Martin and, and all the others have a total of $50 billion. Northrop Grumman, a total of $22 billion. Boeing, a total of $50 billion. So all these big giants have invested in, in all these, um, the largest uh, arms defense, defense uh, suppliers. In addition to that, we're seeing expanded use of private military contractors. If the empire is slow to perform or faced with political resistance, private security firms are now available to fill power elite demands for protection of their assets. The, these protection services include personal security for executives, their families, protection of safe residential and work zones, tactical military advice, training of national police and armed forces, intelligence gathering on democratic movements and opposition groups, weapons acquisitions and war systems management, and strike forces for military action and assassinations. The expanding crisis of desperate refugees, environmental degradation means unlimited opportunities for private military companies uh, to, to seek and be paid for protection by the power elites. G4S is the largest private military company in the world. It is the second largest private employer in the world with 625,000 employees. They operate in 120 countries. Um, <clears throat> they had a revenue of 10 billion in 2014. They increasingly G4S operates in complex environment, except jobs that traditional armies are not trained to do. In Nigeria, Chevron contracts with G4S for counterinsurgency operations. That include fast response mercenaries. G4S undertakes similar operations in the South Sudan, has provided security equipment for checkpoints and prisons in Israel, and security for Jewish settlements. G4S was one of the first of several private security companies protecting the construction of the Dakota Access Pipeline. They were the ones with the dogs that were attacking the protesters, if you remember that, those scenes. Another big one, of course, is Blackwater, now called Academy or Castellus. Its founder, Eric Prince, is still very much in charge of it. He continues to be an advisor to Donald Trump. He, and Prince's sister, Betsy DeVos, is the Secretary of Education in the Trump administration. Castellus' newest division is EP Aviation. You can imagine what EP stands for, Eric Prince. An Air Force of military helicopters providing services in Africa. He's been lobbying Trump and in Afghanistan to privatize the war there and let them take over um, managing militarily uh, the whole, whole country of Afghanistan. Public relations firms and the media. I'm going to kind of blitz through this. We're going to run out of time here. But this is the top six transnational media corporations. I call them the ideologists. Um, they're the ones continually supplying a pro-capital agenda, um, movies and information that are supportive of capitalism um, on an ongoing basis. These 60 major firms control the lion's shares of the, of the news in the world. They are the unofficial spokesperson for the global power elite. And they are, in fact, the global power elite. I call them the ideologists. Owned and controlled by multimillionaires with heavy investments from the global giants, these companies are the foundation 
of capitalist ideological hegemony. We've seen mass consolidation of the media, um, and, and continuing so. At the same time, we're seeing a deeper penetration from public relations propaganda groups. Omnicom, WPP, and IGP are the, are the three largest inside the corporate media system today. So <clears throat> they are the key contributors to the, these companies are the key contributors to hegemony of capitalism in the world. These PRP firms and their corporate media partners serve corporations, governments, non-governmental organizations in an unrelenting ideological assault on the minds of the masses around the world. Their messages encourage a continued acquisition of material products and consumption, an expressed desire for a life of luxury, fear of the others, terrorists, criminals, um, and any people threat, support of the police, acceptance of permanent war and terror, and the notion that private corporations are essentially an element of democracy. This is what Noam Chomsky called engineering opinion and parading enemies. The giants are heavily invested in these top three public relation companies. And in the book, we, we have a list of all the different clients that they have, or not all, but mass pages filled. It's quite amazing. You could go to Safeway and everything would be there, and managed by one of, one of these companies. So the kind, of, the kind of final question here is, you know, what, are we, what needs to be done? And we've identified the people. We can say who the global elite are that are controlling the capital of the world. We know that every, all the big governments, the military and the intelligence agencies work on their behalf. Um, <clears throat> and so where do we go from here? And we, we, we end the book with a letter to the global power elite signed by 90 of my personal friends and associates and other professors from all over the country and Jordan. And uh, we, t we say, you know, you're, you're listed in this book. You know, it's time for you to take a look at the realities of global environmental problems and, and continued wealth concentration. It is unsustainable. It's unsustainable in the immediate future. And we ask you to think of your children and your grandchildren and their grandchildren and take, it, take action, take steps to intervene and turn what you call a trickle down into a sharing of global wealth with the entire world. Um, I don't have a prescription for how we do that. But I think every social movement, every political party, every you know, action group, neighborhood club, whatever, if we could have a common values of the humanitarian values based in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 70 years old this year, it's a pretty good start. That's the moral document that we can all use for humanitarian values. And I teach it in every class, I share it, it's reprinted in the book, um, and it's, we think, a core statement for those of us that have humanitarian interests in the world and want to see uh, a stronger communal sharing of the world's resources. So with that, I will stop and take questions and give comments. You mentioned wars and two other uh, activities that are the basis of the system. The other two were what? Well, I, was, I said that the, there's excess capital and they don't have good, safe places to put it. So, but they want to continue to have returns. So governments facilitate that by having permanent war and permanent war expansion um, and spending, which gives them capital and a return on their capital. Uh, they also do speculative investments in, um, you know, in areas where they're pushing the prices up, so to speak. Uh, and and uh, and then they're doing everything they can to buy up all private or public resources that they can get a return on. So um, it's it's that's everything, schools and highways and water water rights and you know the Sierra Nevada mountains if they could buy them. I mean and get a return. So everything. Um, yes, you you said that um, what needs to be done is somehow or another uh, to redistribute some distribute more of the wealth 
Uh, but, you know, at least, say, from, you know, at least in my life, or, uh, it seems that uh, there's less and less trickle down going, and, and it, it's as if they're looking at the measures taken by this current uh, uh, regime in the United States. They're trying to find ways to reduce the leaking of capital into the hands of ordinary people. Uh, and it, is this, uh, it almost seems as if it's a tendency of the, the whole system that how does that, you know, how can you prevent that from happening? Well, they can't continue to concentrate wealth indefinitely. I mean, Marx knew that, and we know it too. They will try, but we have to convince them to stop trying. And, I mean, they will try to sell cigarettes and Cokes to all the little kids that are living on $1.25 a day in the world and try to make them feel good by, you know, drinking that Coke or smoking that cigarette. And we have to say, we have to stop it. Because it's unsustainable. I think to varying degrees they know it's unsustainable. They're more probably in some ways worried as much about the economy. I mean, the economy as they are the environment. Some are buying homes in various places of the world to go and hide when the crisis hits. But um, we have to convince them and appeal to them directly. So these are the folks we can talk to or should be able to. I don't put their home phone in the, paper, in the book. And most of the time you can't get it anyway, but you can write them all, care of their corporations. There's been protests in front of uh, some of the big bankers' homes, environmental protests, over the past few days. During Occupy, there was a home of the billionaire march that went with it in New York. So, um, but identifying them, I think, is important. And that we need to um, call them in terms of who they are, and that they have the power uh, they could collectively engage in, and make some adjustments and some changes, even a percentage of all financial transactions. I'm not trying to save capitalism here, because it's going to have to be adjusted. I'm trying to prevent global war and billions of people dying, um, and we have to convince them that that's going to happen inevitably in the near future and, unless some, something changes dramatically. How can we transmit the accurate knowledge of the crises, the many crises, of capitalist imperialism so that we can raise consciousness enough to keep people not, or help people not be complicit to it? It's a crisis right now. We are facing a global crisis. We all have to engage and be aware of that and teach and train our children and our families and to tomorrow night, or Tuesday night, I'm speaking at a church in, uh, uh, up in Santa Rosa, the congregational church there, and after the talk, they're going to meet in groups to, you know, to come up with plans regionally and they're in terms of their own congregation, how they can adjust and fight what's happening. Um, I think that's an agenda for us all and that we have to continue to be you know, involved in that. I will continue to write and do as much as I can on this stuff. We have to stand to together collectively for humanitarian values and address that openly every chance that we can. Yeah, so similar to one of the earlier comments, but um, I think the idea that you mentioned, they, uh, they're they aware of what's going on, but um, perhaps Another alternative is not that they just don't care, but they absolutely cannot change course. No matter how much you beg, no matter how many people die, they absolutely cannot change course for very important reasons. So even a few years ago under the Obama administration, there was a Pentagon report about climate change um, arguing that the need for increased militarization, precisely border walls, would be necessary due to the massive expansion of um, climate refugees. We know obviously uh, in the 80s, ExxonMobil um, issued its own report, internal memo, uh, explaining definitively that the, the fossil fuel companies were responsible for climate change and therefore in response to it, it needed to fund propaganda to argue that climate change did not exist because it was going to threaten its own company. Um, 
And in fact, today, what, there's a new kind of market emerging. They call it climate adaptation market. It's basically a similar version to what Naomi Klein would call a disaster capitalism. Namely that given the catastrophes of climate change that are coming, there's going to be new investment opportunities, new markets, and we want to proceed. This is a completely conscious global elite. They are absolutely conscious of the consequences and um, I, don't, I think it's important to say that the idea that our, our, our alternative is to sort of show them what they already know and hope that some sort of new morality will emerge. They have their own morality to justify this. Their own morality is basically the one that's been around for decades and centuries really, which is this is the only economic system that humanity can possibly devise. So that's their justification. This is the best we can get. I, I think it's important to say that the other elite, the only other elite here, is the people who do the work to make the society run in the first place. That the power they have is investment, the power they have is ownership, but really the people who make this planet run and do the work are the only ones who can take it away from them. They're not going to reverse course. I think that's important to mention. Thanks. We're going to have to make it happen. <laughs> they're not going to do it. You're right. I, you know, they, they don't have, they, they see it as a trap that they have to keep going forward and keep that bike upright and keep, keep moving forward. Um, I don't know how we do that without destroying the world. Um, but we have to try. And we have to tell them that um, not only is it not okay, but you're driving us to open resistance and ultimately open rebellion um, worldwide to, to stop this. They have to stop it, and they have to realize that if they don't, that's what's going to happen. And, and it's not just the environment, but it's, it's, it's resistance from people in the world. And it'll start with food riots in, in various countries around the world, and it'll become so massive that they won't be able to control it with, with a military empire that they've got. And our ch task is to try to prevent that from happening and billions of deaths. And, war, and global war between the, the rivals. Um, we have to move everything we can to, 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 to resist that. I don't have a prescription, but you're right. I mean. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you very much for the lecture. I really learned a lot. And I guess my question is, you mentioned how Russia will always remain different um, for the eyes of the Trilateral Commission and how the giants are just waiting to explore resources and markets. And I was wondering if you could expand on that, and also specifically how uh, Russia is today portrayed by the media with myths like uh, Trump is a puppet of Putin and Russia just you know, messed up the elections and so on. Thank you. I haven't seen any evidence that the Russians were behind anything to do with Trump and the election. Um, they keep saying that, that the, the, you know, there were blots and that sort of thing that happened. I mean, we're all getting blotted all the time, every day, um, with automated uh, messages on, on social media and all that kind of stuff. I don't think the Russians had a whole lot to do with it. Um, <clears throat> Putin, however, has been, you know, the, we had a great deal of impact after, after Yeltsin and during that time period where we could invest. The oligarchs became incredibly rich in Russia. They transformed the entire country. Poverty was massively increased. And, and Putin, for the last decade or so, the living has gotten better for average Russians. Um, and he's resisting capital penetration from in that reserve. You know, they're trying to, to do that. And, and he, they, they had, we had a deal with them that we wouldn't put NATO on their borders. And every country, you know, now has got a NATO forces there. And they, they want Ukraine to go NATO. Um, so they see the writing on the wall, and they've been invaded twice in the, in the last hundred years, and um, they don't want to be taken out. They have vast resources. They know that. Um, and they're going to stand and resist, and they've got the capabilities of wiping this country out completely. And so we have to rec remember that um, on a regular basis. We keep pressuring them. I mean... And Putin is, um, 
not going to take it in certain areas, and Crimea was one of them. They weren't going to give that up. And Syria is the other, where they have stood their ground. And they weren't going to let us do a coup there or engineer a, a, a resistance movement. And our, the guys on our list, which we call al-Qaeda, which in Arabic means the list, the ones that we trained and used in Macedonia and Libya and then put into Syria, um, that we help finance and support. That's, uh, so they, they know that. And um, we'll, we, that resistance won't stop. Uh, thanks, I appreciated all that. And uh, I just wanted to say that I think <clears throat> what's really needed is a mass consciousness raising in order to get the kind of leverage we need to make this shift. And uh, I think two uh, places to sort of coalesce around is one, the legitimacy of the global system and the idea that everybody is equally an inheritor of the earth. And I think that that idea has a lot of uh, resonance with a lot of people. And a lot of people then would say, well, we have this now, so if we transition away from it, it will destabilize everything. So that's the other sort of barrier. And <clears throat> uh, so one idea is, well, if we tax these super rich people enough to make a huge difference, they try to move their capital to other countries or offshore or hide it in various ways. So in addition to raising consciousness, it needs to be sort of a global movement, I think. So I'm interested in hearing uh, how we can sort of uh, make it so they can't move the capital around so easily and we can tax the hell out of them. And I also wanted to say that uh, uh, an idea that goes back to us being equally inheritors of the earth in terms of a way of thinking about the shift we need to make is we need to give rights per person rather than rights per dollar. Uh, uh, so one way to do that is to redistribute money, but another way is to make money mean less. And just one example of that would be, well, if you need a car to get everywhere, that's saying in order to be able to have a life, you need to have a car. That means you need to have more life, more money. But an example of a more human uh, technology is just a sidewalk or uh, bike paths and that kind of thing. So, but what I was really hoping to get from you is that idea of global capital <clears throat> and just uh, putting a cap on them and saying, all right, in five years, there's not gonna be anyone in the world <clears throat> who's got more than whatever amount, $10 million or something, because we're gonna well, yeah, and whatever that amount is, but trying to come up with a global idea and a plan and say, this is going to be the maximum amount, and we're going to tax you down to that amount and uh, make it so they can't run anywhere. Okay, that's good. I want to remind us that the Occupy movement left, I mean, despite what corporate media says, how what a big failure it was and all that kind of stuff, that's baloney. They were scared to death. They infiltrated every single Occupy movement in this country, including the one in our town, Sebastopol. And they wanted to know, the police were penetrating, they had people, you know, informing, you know, was this revolutionary? And it was in one sense, because we have that mantra, the 99% versus the 1%, and it's in all of our consciousness now. And whatever social movements emerge, uh, whether it's Bolivarian in the South or the Chinese workers' movements that are ongoing, um, resistance in, in Spain and, and, uh, and, and Greece and Italy in terms of the um, <clears throat> austerity kinds of pro programs and stuff. It's, it's happening everywhere. People are resisting and, and aware that they're, they're getting screwed. So it's time for us all to take that very actively um, in our lives on a regular basis. Thank you for your comments. To me, what you contributed to the discussion is really looking at who are the people who are at the top of this monopolized capital. 
um, and it's a tiny group of people who administer a global system um, with, it's sort of amazing how much they agree on how critical their system is and how there's only one way to go um, within certain parameters. But uh, to me, what you uh, explained basically are also arguments for why a global socialist society could work because it's, uh, in a way, it's not that, you know, when people argue against socialism saying, oh, you know, it would never work because, yeah, maybe these tiny little experiments here and there won't work because of skill, it won't work because humans are too competitive or, you know, they're too violent. But you just explained that, in fact, these people, you know, do, they completely agree, they're collaborative in how they reach their goals and, uh, are able to uh, really make decisions to to uh, justify the, this system. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that that uh, perspective. Thank you. Sure, I don't have a prescri prescription um, other than I believe that our values are communal. We grew up in tribes. We grew up in community. And it took capitalism and hundreds of years of making, trying to make us competitive against each other to try to push that out of us, but it's still there. We still care about others. We still think about you know, our family and our neighbors and who we you know, respect and care about. That's, and we have to continue to protect that and, and use it in our mobilizing. I was wondering if you could talk more about the different types of organizations. Um, I know you kind of said that um, the G30 is sort of the most important type sometimes is referred to, but um, I wondered the difference between like the, these private conferences that they have, like Davos, and then these like national conferences, and what the sort of, um, what's the difference between what these like global elites are um, coordinating on and um, how does that really because these yes they're, they're, they're very conscious of the fact that they um, they're this intertwined elite class that is very conscious of its position against all of the rest of us um, but they are still like negotiating every single decision that's being made and I wondered if you could talk about some of those meetings um, a little bit more without getting too technical The transnational capitalist class is still debated um, between sociologists and political scientists and others as to what extent their consciousness and their interaction is really represented as a class. Um, I tend to think it is because these 300, they really are all in the same places, came from the same educational backgrounds, and, and don't, if they don't know each other personally, they certainly know of each other because of what they're doing. Um, that's pretty class-like behavior. We don't have the extensive studies that we had in the 60s and the 70s, Bill Domhoff, who rules America, some of those kinds of things to show the class penetration globally yet. We've got a little bit of it, but not a lot. But what we do know is that they are interacting in non-governmental groups, privately, privately funded, privately protecting themselves, and uh, using their resources to influence and make policy um, both in, inside of governments and inside the, non, the, the, the transnational government organizations, the trans, transnational states, and the, and the World Bank, the WTO, all of those. And those impact us all on a daily basis. And they keep the rest of the world that borrows money from them uh, in debt. And it keeps elites in, in other countries in, you know, supplying them resources back so that the net transfer of wealth and centralized capital continues to go on and making these people richer and richer. That can't be sustained. I think uh, one of the best contributions uh, to, to this evening's uh, talk has been from uh, our comrade over there that she mentioned the conscious the conscious character of uh, the global elite exploiting, you know, uh, us, the working class and its allies. 
Uh, these efforts are very done uh, consciously. As for example, uh, the global elite uh, invests a lot in research for the armed forces and, uh, you know, uh, for example, uh, there is a document by the Federation of American Scientists that uh, speaks of its title Insurgencies and Counterinsurgencies, which, you know, they uh, did a lot of research how to try to contain uh, insurgencies and so on. And also, it's obviously the uh, a manual uh, 324, which is called the Army Field Manual Counterinsurgency uh, uh, Program, which is uh, done with the cooperation of the University of Chicago, and was uh, you know led none other than the by the notorious General Petraeus. So uh, you know it's a link, as you said, you know uh, between these uh, global elites and the military and so on, because they are the guardians, obviously, of the uh, rule by corporate. Uh, and you know uh, financial assets and all these uh, elite ruling groups. Uh, the you mentioned about the special forces and all these uh, deployments of uh, military personnel globally, and definitely uh, special forces are forces that most of the work that they do is counterinsurgency, definitely. And I yes, and I uh, you know no because uh, I was in the military and. Uh, they definitely, that's one of their tasks. So, uh, you know, they are definitely doing, like she said, uh, a conscious efforts to, uh, because they know and they want to prevent our overthrow by our class to this uh, group of global exploiters. Thank you. I appreciate what you said about um, the history that we have as a species of living communally and organizing our life communally, that this is not the only way that we've lived. And I just wanted to respond to what um, the man behind me said about uh, the idea that we're all equal inheritors of the earth and that people respond well to that idea. And then on the other hand, we should figure out how to tax the hell out of the rich. And I just want to say, I don't think we need to tax the hell out of the rich because actually the presumption there is that they have the right to continue their international uh, organization of society to keep them in total control and that our goal should be to pressure them to allow us to have a little bit more of that wealth that in fact the international working class has created. So I'm just, just wanted to put out there that the goal that I have certainly isn't to tax the hell out of the rich, but actually to take it all away from them, and that with the power that the working class has to actually create all that wealth, we can turn it around and reorganize it communally. Thank you. I mean, that's, I won't disagree. <laughs> I uh, want to thank you for your talk. Um, I think that what's important with you presenting your um, information to a lot of people is uh, what you what you talked about, what is, might be happening in Santa Rosa tomorrow. And I find it useful for um, having talks like this and this organization that puts them on. Um, I think really, what we're all trying to say is that uh, we're, what we need to be talking about is uh, the ideologies that we all um, want to live by. Um, because the corporate elite, the global giants are telling us to live a certain type of way, you know, the sur survival of the fittest, and they're protecting that idea very much so um, because they're going to continue to expand and whatnot. And I think that if we actually have that contradiction in our head that, that that is an idea that we all are supposed to live off of or we're supposed to live collectively and, and create a different world. That's what we need to be doing every single day um, through our actions with like our workplaces because this is what um, our bosses 
tell us and feed us constantly when we're told we need to work faster, we need to, you know, and if you can't survive and you can't work here, well, you chose to, to work here, so work somewhere else, right? So I think that this is really important to think about, like, what it actually means when you say to live every single day, to, to really put an example out there. What does this actually mean to respond back um, because if we're, if we're, not, we're not trying to just, you know, survival of the fittest, like we want to collectively change the society for ourselves so that we don't have to feel the pressures of the, just the global elite because we're, all we're doing is providing and accounting for them, but we're sh we should be accounting for, for each other. Um, so I just wanted to, to mention that. I would just add that we should, you know, teach, read, and memorize the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, that's, that's a value that is incredibly important for us all to retain and own. I'm sorry, point again. Thanks for your patience. I mean, yeah, you know, this, Peter, nobody's left. I mean, you guys are great. Thank you. <laughs> Peter, thank you for your lifelong work, and thanks for the book. Um, uh, th this book actually uh, gives us a lot of great facts to justify why we are anti-capitalist. Um, I remember over 20 years ago, Bernadette Devlin was here in Berkeley, and she, she I remember she said that the ruling class will never give up its positions of power, even if it means the destruction of the human race. Uh, it's also been said that there's trillions of dollars of oil, coal, and minerals in the earth, and they don't want it to go to waste. You know, it's, 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 a, it, it's we're doing too little too late, and uh, if we can't bring this system down, can at best we hope for a total economic collapse? I mean... <laughs> well, I'm hoping not for a total economic collapse. <laughs> that would be pretty messy and a lot of people would die. Um, I'm hopefully, I mean, people are dying every day now. So if you understand, if we understand that, and we could redistribute the food, we could make everybody, you know, have a life that's reasonable in some capacity and some sort of minimum standard for everybody in the world that was well above what half the world is today that could easily be done. And we may have to twist some arms and really pressure and have some major kinds of resistance going on to convince them to do that. But it would get really terrible, I think, if we had if we went to had a civil war of some sort and we really got violent. That would be awful for all of us. So we're going to take the last hand up here, and then I'll just. Oh, I was pointing at you before, and you didn't. I, Sorry. I didn't. Back I didn't have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to uh, also join in thanking you uh, for this this your contribution. I think. Um, sort of caused me to think about a number of things. I don't think that these people are really, they're, they're, I liked your bicycle analogy because I don't think that these people are really in charge. The system is in charge of them. And I think when we look at it more in that way, that there's, they're, they may be steering it, but if it stops, like you said, they're off, it collapses, whatever, you know, however it stopped. And to try to convince them, um, you know, it's, some people might be trying to do that, um, I think their, their positions are interchangeable. Just because there's somebody who's in the seat, somebody's on the handlebars, and somebody's on the back, doesn't mean that they're not replaceable. This system, has its a logic and an illogic of its own, and these people are basically the managers at this point. And I don't think that, even if they get off, 
somebody else is going to get on. That's what the nature of the system is. They've shown this is, they, somebody over here talked about something international. This is an international terrorist class. They are terrorizing the population. They are terrorizing, they're extinguishing species at a phenomenal rate because of the functioning of their system. And for the first time in the consciousness of humanity, we, sh we can understand we do not have time to monkey around. We know the functioning of the system. They know it. They're doing everything impossible to keep it in place. I just have one question, uh, very quickly, is the families don't control, these are not just the managers, so the Rockefellers and those, that legacy of early capitalists, they're just participants now, they are no longer the directors and sort of that long-held knowledge of operating the system is no longer in their hands? I think the answer to that, because we don't know the full answer in terms of the, the class structure. Um, more research could be done on the global power elite and the, and the top 1%. What we do know is, though, that concentrated capital, the real money in the world, is international, is global, and the primary, that 50 trillion, and controlled by 199 people, they're making the decisions of where that money gets invested. They, it's not all their money. I mean, it's billionaires' money and 36, millionaire, 36 million millionaires and other people, and it's Cal, uh, CalPERS pension plans. It, it, it is the capital of the, of the world. And um, they are influencing that and creating a crisis a crisis of, of humanity in terms of poverty at the bottom, the bottom half, and um, environmental destruction for us all. And we're all breathing part of that. These you know, fires are, are horrendous and directly related to global warming. So we've got a serious incapacity by these elites to, to, to turn it around. So they have to be encouraged. And every, you know, they could make decisions to reinvest capital in other places. Ultimately, um, the continued privatization of capitalism worldwide is not going to be sustained. And it's a problem that's just going to go on unless we fix it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I was listening carefully, though, to the responses and questions. And there seems to be, there's something I'd, I'd like to at least uh, touch. And that's this question about what the ruling class knows. You know, you keep, I keep hearing, oh, they know what they're doing. They know they're evil people. Well, you know, actually, I'm not so sure what they know. And the reason I'm not so sure is because I don't think they have a homogenous consciousness and I don't think they can develop a homogenous consciousness. Because unlike the proletariat, that is a class that actually has something in common. We own nothing. We sell our labor to live. It's very clear. The, the, the people, that, the ruling class so-called, and especially the elites that he's talking about, there's, pseudo, there's a pseudo or a false consciousness. It's not like they understand that socialism is superior to capitalism. Not, if, not that I care whether or not they do, but I think we shouldn't get caught up on that. Because what they're, you know, there may be another, you know, Engels among the ruling class that comes over to the proletariat. Yeah, maybe. But generally speaking, their worldview is very skewed and fractured. They, they don't believe anything. They just accumulate and keep accumulating. That's what they do. We don't know what they think because the consciousness they have is a false consciousness that this is the best possible world of all worlds. That's what they believe. They may have a couple that, 
you know, deviate or think differently. Doesn't matter. Generally speaking, because if you look at them, they kill each other. Yeah. They want to go to war with each other, world war, nuclear weapons, and they constantly destroy each other and put each other out of business. Strange class. But certainly not someone to look to for any moral compass here. You know what I mean? So I just think sister was right. It don't matter what they think. They got to go. That's, that's what I think. They got to go. <laughs> we know who they are, so that's at least one part that we've got here. 